right. Hi, I'm going to get our little show on the road. Um, my name is Lainey Rose and I'm the events manager here at East City Bookshop. It's wonderful to be with you all today. Thanks so much for being here in person and for tuning into our live stream if you're watching that way. Our calendar is always full of exciting events, and there's a few coming up that I want to make sure is on everyone's radar. At the beginning of next month, we are having two back-to-back -back romance events. Elena Armas is coming to ECB for her next novel, The Long Game. I see some nodding heads. Yep, I expect to see you all here. Uh, and we'll be in, con in conversation with BK Borison. So that should be a really fun event. Yeah. And then the very next night, we'll have a debut author, Andy Burke, to discuss her sapphic romance, Fly With Me, which I've already read, and it's phenomenal, and I'm seeing, uh, yes, more nods, so I expect to see all of you there. Um, she'll be in conversation with beloved local author, Susie Dumont, so if you love queer romances, you won't want to miss out. Uh, and if you love queer stories, you should sign up for our newsletter for our LGBT book club, Queering the Narrative, which I co-host. Uh, every month, we pick a genre, and then you can pick any queer book within that genre, and we discuss how the conventions and tropes of the genre affect telling a queer story and vice versa. Uh, every month, we also send out a newsletter with upcoming information about events, new releases we're excited about, and as many memes as we can possibly fit in. All this information is also on our website. And the last thing that I'll plug, it's Bookstore Romance Day, which is coming up this weekend. And we are having 10% off all romance titles in the store. So you need to be here. Uh, you can see we have stocked up our romance section um we will also be doing giveaways we'll have a guest author bookseller it is going to be a fun time we have to have you here so before we get to tonight's event some housekeeping details number one if you could take a moment to silence your cell phones we would appreciate it uh number two if you need a bathroom it's upstairs past the cash registers and the greeting cards number three we will have time for questions tonight for both our in-person and virtual attendees so even if you're watching via zoom you can participate Please put those questions in the Q&A feature so that we can see them and ask on your behalf. And please wait till the Q&A feature to ask your questions. Thank you. Uh, and finally, most importantly, if you need to purchase a copy of any of tonight's books, we have them available and be happy to help you out with that. All copies are upstairs at the register and can be purchased prior to the signing line. So for tonight's event, Tim has been a dear friend of mine since his debut, and I could not be more thrilled to be hosting the launch for New Adult. Tim's writing is charming, hysterical, and makes you believe in magic. I will love anything and everything that he writes, but this dazzling romantic comedy has truly taken the cake for me, and I will be screeching my praises for it into any microphone I can get my hands on. 23-year-old Nolan Baker wants it all by the time he's 30. Too bad he's single and barely able to cover his own expenses. Nolan gets a wake-up call and decides it's time to quit comedy and make good on his practical dreams. Most importantly, asking out Drew, his best friend. But after standing up Drew, ditching his sister's wedding, uh, and disappointing everyone he loves, Nolan desperately wishes on a set of magical healing crystals to skip to the good part of his life. When he wake up, wakes up the next morning, it's seven years later, he's a successful comedian and has everything he always thought he wanted. Everything that is, except his friends and family, none of whom are talking to his future self. And please give me a moment while I switch my page. Thank you. Uh, with nowhere else to turn, Nolan sets out to find the only person he trusts to help, except Drew is all grown up now, too. He's hot, successful, and hates Nolan's guts. As Nolan works to get back to his younger self and the life he so carelessly threw away, he'll have to prove that he's not the man everyone thinks they know in order to regain Drew's trust, friendship, and maybe his heart. Our author of the evening is Timothy Janoski, who is a queer, multidisciplinary storyteller based in Washington, D.C., he holds a bachelor's degree from Muhlenberg College and is a self-appointed has a self-appointed certificate in rom-com studies. When he's not daydreaming about a young Hugh Grant, he's telling jokes, playing characters, and writing books. Joining Tim in conversation tonight is TJ Alexander, who writes about queer love. Originally from Florida, they received their MA in writing and publishing from Emerson College in Boston. They live in New York City with their wife and their various houseplants. Please welcome our authors of the evening. Hello. Hello. Hi. Timothy. Hi. Hi. How's it going? It's all right. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm excited to be here to... Ooh. <laughs> we didn't see any we'll of this put those work. there. That's nice. This is your third book. Yeah. That's impressive. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for being impressed. It is impressive. <laughs> um, how, like, how are you feeling about it? Pub Day is... 
it's a it's a bit of a day. Yeah. Um, I feel excited about this one in particular because I think this one is kind of I, I don't pick favorite children, but if I had to pick a favorite child, it would be this one. Um, the other ones aren't here. The other ones aren't here. Yeah. Like if they're on the shelves, we know they can't hear. Um, I personally, what I loved writing about this book is that like, it is the culmination of my boy meets boy series. Mm -hmm. um, Lainey Rose made me these lovely bracelets to commemorate the occasion. Um, and I feel like what I got to do with this one is I got to do my sweet book, my sassy book. And then in this book, I got to do sweet bumbling guy wakes up sassy, then goes back to being sweet and bumbly, which I was like, oh, it just it encapsulates the whole experience. It Every comes all food group. Circle. Yeah, yeah, all the food groups. Exactly. <laughs> if so you want to eat well, you read all three. And you should. Nutrition is important. Um, so how did this book come to be? Did you always have this book in mind as like part of the series or like, tell us, tell us the story of how this came to be. Yeah. So has anybody here seen 13 going on 30? Yeah. So uh, we watched it last night. That's my partner in the back. So he raises in. Um, so I watched 13 going on 30 for the first time when I was like eight in a hotel room with my cousins, only my, only, only my, my uh, female cousins, because all, all the men were off playing paintball or whatever. And they were like, let's hang out. The two genders, let's, the two genders, paintball and 13 going on 30. Um, and my parents were like, you can rent a movie on the TV. And this was back in the day when it was like probably like 1099 still. You had to like, oh, yeah. you, were, you were committing to a rental. And I really wanted to watch 13 Going on 30. And so I was eight. I didn't really know anything. And I just remember being like enamored by this like whimsical, fun, cotton candy colored world about this like prepubescent person who like wakes up in the body of an adult and like has to bumble her way into success and love and I was just like, huh, okay. And every book in this series, I started with, okay, what's a piece of media that I love and how can I make it really gay? Yes. Um, and so that was kind of the jumping off point. And then after I got that idea down, I was like, okay, so it's going to be about a time jump. What can I do? What's going to cause this time jump? And I was doing kind of like a rabbit holey deep dive into celebrity wellness culture. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And I, so what I found most fascinating about celebrity wellness culture, so the the, the celebrity wellness brand in this book, it's called Dupe. Um, legally distinct from legally any distinct. other brand you've heard of. Yeah. We cut the line about how it's duping people. Uh -huh. into, yeah. Um, and so, cause that was too literal. Um, and so it's called dupe. And what I was interested in is that like these companies, they use, um, controversy as free marketing. Basically they do these absurd things in order to get big reactions out of the general population so that they can sell millions and millions of products. And I was super interested in specifically like snake oil lawsuits and how it's like, this cream is going to get, you're going to look 10 years younger. And then you put it on and you get like acne and you're like 42 and you're like that's not supposed to happen um and so I was like wait okay what if those products did the really wild outlandish things they said they were supposed to do and so that led me down a rabbit hole of different websites where I was looking at the products and I was like oh okay crystals what could crystals do and so I just spent forever being like okay like I'm gonna marry these two things into a very gay time jump romance and this is the result. And uh, I, I think I did a pretty good job. I think so, too. Like, it's not just you. Thank you. <laughs> it's so charming. And, like, I'm so happy to hear how your brain works. Because that is, like, the perfect distillation of how a book should be made. Just, like, a weird idea. And, like, I, I listened to a podcast once. And then this book happened. Well, I find it so funny because I, every time, so I come to a lot of events here at East City, but I'll like go to book events or I'll listen to podcasts and stuff. And every author like comes to books differently. But I always find that like for me specifically, like if you read a book of mine, you can pinpoint one weird cultural pop culture-y thing that I'm just deeply obsessed with in that moment. So like Never Been Kissed, I was really obsessed with female film directors and movies from the 1970s. When I read Matthew Prince, I was like weirdly into my Hallmark era. Like this one, I just was going down the rabbit hole of like, you know crystals and miracle creams and you know and it was just like a fun organic way to develop a story around something that was just exciting me because if I'm not excited to sit down and write like I don't think anyone's going to be excited to sit down and read it so I, I don't know I just like to follow the little rabbit hole and see where it leads that's that's so true um do you mind if I ask yeah 
just us two. Okay. Yeah, there's no one else here. Are there any like woo-woo things like crystals that you personally do believe in? Everyone gasped. <laughs> I, okay. So I dated someone in high school who was incredibly into tarot, incredibly into crystals, incredibly into the woo-woo. I was incredibly into them. And therefore I had, I think, adopted a lot of these interests because you know how you, when, when you have a partner, you're just, you want to be engaged. You want to have a conversation, you want to talk to them. Um, and so I was like, I love crystals. <laughs> like I am going to learn tarot. And I, like my freshman year of college, like walked around like with an amethyst necklace. And I was like very much projecting this air of like, I believe in manifestation. I believe in all this stuff. So it's definitely rooted in something that I very much convinced myself that I did believe in at the time. Now, not so much, especially because like I relate mostly to Nolan, who's the protagonist in the story where um, his older sister, Cece, works for Dupe. And that is where this whole kind of thing comes in. <laughs> Nolan is like, this is a scam. <laughs> like you work for a scam you're selling the capitalistic nightmare and you just don't care and she's like no they're products they do things like this is just how capitalism works like get over it and he, and i have that skeptic in me where i don't like i don't i i feel like a bad queer romance author when i say this but i don't i don't know my sun my moon and my rise so like i don't know that stuff i don't either right but it feels like we're excluded right yeah. sometimes where you're like ah it feels like you know when you go to church and you're just like pretending like you know the words to the song <laughs> You could open the book, but that would be too much work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, amazing. Okay. I have some questions for you. Amazing. Um, I've heard you do stand up. Mm, I did, yeah. You you've done stand up. I've done it, yeah. You've done stand up. Very similar to how Nolan, um, our hero, is a stand-up comedian. Exactly. Um, and you write rom coms. Mm. Do you think there is a difference in writing one kind of comedy versus the other? Or is all comedy kind of the same process for you? Ooh. So my journey to comedy was like, I wasn't, I was always interested in making people laugh. I love to tell stories. Then when I went to college, I did long form improv, which, which is such a thing that you think about now. Like I think about it now and I'm like, that's embarrassing. Um, like, how dare I? And I was in the cool improv group too. I was there were the, levels. Oh, there were levels. Yes, there was. There was the improv group that I was in. Not that I'm patting myself on the back here. There was the improv group that I was in. And that's the one that like on a Friday night after you got drunk and you were about to go to a party, you stopped into their show for the 45 minutes they were going to perform. And then you went and got like absolutely blackout drunk. There were other groups where it was like, we're not going to stop. Like, no, we're just going to go to the blackout part. We're just going to skip that. And so I did improv through college and I, I really enjoyed improv. I thought it was like a really fun way to learn how to yes. And which is a really important skill for an author because we're basically just yes anding these little people in our head for 80,000 words, you know, three months, and then we edit them. And so uh, when I graduated college, I was working as um, an actor and doing commercials and stuff like that. And while I was doing that, um, I got in touch with a comedy agent who basically said, like, it would be really great if you had some material um, that was like stand up y, like, you know, do you ever write jokes? And I said, no, but I write down stories and I think they're funny. Like, would that work? And she was like, well, why don't you try it? And I mean, it maybe doesn't seem this way, but I'm incredibly introverted. Like I do need my time to myself to like process and reset. And so for me specifically, like I decided to do a little like Nolan in the book, I decided to do a little living room stand up set for just my friends and family. And I recorded it and people were like, wow, you know, you are good at making, holding the tension and then making people laugh at the end by telling these kind of embarrassing, kind of cute stories from your childhood. And I was like, how can I translate into that into writing a rom-com that maybe just like, you know, these are fictional characters in fictional situations, but they're telling stories in a very similar fashion. Um, and so I think I approach them very similarly in the sense that I like, my sense of humor is always the same. I'm always bringing the same voice to the party. It's just like how I execute the story is what comes in a little differently. And as far as things that like make you laugh. Oh, yeah. What is the type of humor that like always gets you? Ooh, that's a good question. I mean, I, this this is a little weird, but I would say that like story comedy is the kind of comedy that really gets me laughing. Like I love when someone tells like that embarrassing story from the family reunion. Like I love when somebody tells the story from like, 
their fifth grade graduation when they sang the wrong words and then they fell off the rafters. Like I find that hysterical, right? Because like there is so much humor in everyday life that I just think like there's so much pain, like, and it's just nice to be able to laugh. It's just nice to be able to take those moments and say, okay, like they happened. How can I turn them into something that we can all share collectively? And so that's what always gets me. I love that. I'm the same way. Weird little dramas. Weird little dramas. Exactly. Everyday slice of life. Yeah. Sort of things. I just want to know me. the weird stuff you did as a child. I want to know the weird make-believe games you played. Just like that stuff. Well, we have half an hour. I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, Great. So um, fact I have written down here. Gay people are funnier than straight people. This is true. Yes, yes. absolutely. Sorry. It's true. Um, we all know it's true, but why do you think that is? <laughs> oh my gosh. So, I mean, all right, I'm going to answer this from Nolan's perspective. So I would think that Nolan specifically was coming into his own at a time where he was just very, I would say conflicted about who he was. And so a way to connect with other people was to make jokes, make light of things. I think we as gay folk, queer folk, we have to kind of I don't want to say make concessions, but we have to learn how to navigate the world in a way that maybe our straight peers don't. And so we build these coping mechanisms and skills that help us to uh, socialize, that help us to engage, that help us to just connect with other people, especially when we're hiding so much. One of the things that Nolan says in the story is that underpinning every joke is a little bit of truth. And I think that that's the thing, like you can let out a little bit of truth in a joke that maybe you're not ready to share the full story yet. So for Nolan, he probably knew he was gay from a very young age, but he wasn't ready to share that. But if I can tell you a joke that makes you laugh and brings you into this like sweet cathartic moment, Maybe I can let you see a little bit of the real me underneath. And so I think we see with Nolan specifically in the book is that on stage, he's very authentic. And off stage, he is this messy, bumbling person with like these really broad misperceptions about life and love and how to interact with other people. And so, yeah, I think it's just we build these coping mechanisms that kind of come out. I know that's true for me. I mean, I was the kid at the lunch table who was like telling the knock knock joke because I knew that that was going to get people to socialize with me and engage with me and hang out with me, you know? Um, and so I wanted to gift Nolan that little ability as well. Yeah, it's the wanting positive attention, yeah, but not about the thing that you don't want people to notice. Exactly. Yeah. And it's almost like, I would say that like comedy in general is kind of like, it's a way of letting people in, but it is also a way of showcasing your best and worst self. It's admitting the light and the dark people don't often like to like acknowledge the dark. And so I think comedy is a really good way to let people know that like, hey, I'm a multifaceted human. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you have a, a theory about why queer folk are more are funnier than our straight people? Well, we're better. Um, <laughs> just as people. Uh, no, I think, I mean, just along the lines of what you were saying so eloquently, I'm just going to piggyback on your answer, which is what I do on panels all the time. Um, find the smart person and just say, oh, I agree with everything that Timothy said. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like, you know, it, it's not even that, you know, queer people tend to be hiding something necessarily or like, you know, they're not prepared to share their whole selves. I think it's this idea that like, you know, when you walk into a room, there might be people who are not with you. And I think making people laugh is one of like the surefire ways that you can be like, I can get people with me. I can get them on my side if I can get them to yeah. have a good time. Right. I love that. Yeah. And I think that's really, that is a big part of it is having a good time. Right. Like, cause we always want to connect with people over these like shared moments. And I feel like memories for me, key memories from like my life specifically, like I always remember like the good joke told. Yes. I always remember the big laugh. Like when I leave a movie, like I remember the big laugh line. I don't necessarily remember the name of the main character's aunt. So it's just like, I think it's a good way to leave a good impression is to be, you know, just like the life of the party kind of yeah. have a couple jokes up your sleeve. Yeah. No one likes a sour puss. Exactly. Yeah. So um, you and I have something else in common. And, okay. Your main character is a stand-up comedian. Indeed. I have a book coming out this Christmas. Called? Uh, called Second Chances in Newport Stephen. It's wonderful. Oh, you should read cute. it. Yep. And um, that main character is also a comedian. Yes. Why have we made the biggest mistake of our lives by doing this? Why? <laughs> <laughs> Why 
why did we decide to write characters who are supposed to be the funniest person in the room? Mm. Because we could have just made them like nuclear scientists and it would have been way easier <laughs> because it's hard writing someone who's supposed to be really funny all the time. Um, how did you do that? How did you pull that off? Well, I just have to say that I don't think being a nuclear scientist would have been so much easier. <laughs> we, I was, we were just having dinner and we were talking, um, the, the waiter at our table was like, you have a book coming out today. I said, yes, I have a book coming out today. He says, what's it about? I said, it is a queer time travel romance. He goes, how'd you go about the science on that? <laughs> I said, actually, I didn't. <laughs> I said, it's just crystals. And he was like, mm, yeah, I don't think that would work. And I was like, yeah, I didn't think it would either. I was like, you have to suspend your disbelief a little bit, which is just the whole romance genre in general. Um, so I don't think the scientist would have been that much better. I will say that what was funny is that I like to take things from my own life. So like I mentioned, I, I, I like to play what if with my character sometimes. And one of the ways I played what if in New Adult is that I was kind of dip dipping my toe into being a stand-up comic right before COVID happened when that whole industry shut down. And so like, I never really got to do like the thing that Nolan does in this book is like, go on the auditions, do the clubs, do the networking, do the tight five, tight 10, like start building up to be an opener, like all that stuff. I never got to do any of that stuff. And so like, it was a way of like exploring the what could have been for me. But my editor very much when I pitched this book was like, comedian protagonists can be very hard because your sense of humor might not match the reader's sense of humor. And if the reader doesn't like their sense of humor, the book's done, right? Like they're not, they're not coming to the party. They're not flipping the page. And so she was like, just be very careful with how much you put on the page, what you hold back, because she was like, half of stand up specifically, and, and I know this from experience, is it's delivery. Half of what you're saying, like you could say the most monotonous thing, like you could be like refried beans. And if you say that, I, I've said refried beans, but I meant refried beans. No, I loved it. I, that was my choice, actually. That was the delivery. It's wonderful. No, but I'm just saying you could just say the most mundane thing. And if you deliver it in a way that holds the tension and has the release, like people will laugh and they'll they'll join in on you. And she was like, the, the voice in a reader's head is not always going to match the voice in your head, right? So she was like, just just kind of be cognizant of that. And so I was really very, I, I want to say sparing with how much we see Nolan actually on stage delivering material. We see him in his present timeline at 23, delivering kind of an off the cuff set because everything goes out of his head. He's just been broken up with. He's kind of a wreck. Then we see him in the future. And it was a way to kind of juxtapose who he was at 23 and who he turns out to be in 30 when he wakes up seven years in the future where he's doing this like mean punch down comedy that like has gained him legions of fans and millions of followers and all this money but it's not satisfying and it's also not very nice um and so I think it was just it was both the chance to play what if but it was also a good shorthand for me to be able to be like look how this character has changed Look how this thing that means so much to them that they would sacrifice everything in their life to succeed in this field can, for better or worse, like sell out. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to play around with that. Did you have like a specific thing in mind when you decided to do a stand up comedian or just a comedian in general? Oh, I had no thoughts. <laughs> I didn't think it through at all. And as soon as I started writing him, uh, my main character, uh, who's also a comedian, um, I was like, okay, so he's just like really funny. And then like I had in parentheses, he says something really funny here. <laughs> like, I'll come back to that later. That'll, that'll be like a second draft sort of thing. <laughs> like, yeah, it was a lot of putting things off because you're right. It's really, really difficult to write down jokes in print that are meant to be said out loud because you can't control how a reader is going to be reading that to themselves um you know it yeah I didn't think you you were much smarter about it <laughs> well I, I I guess I only really thought about it right because it like I said it was something that I kind of wanted to do and I probably won't go back to now that I'm considering it and the book thing seems to be doing okay um I I, I probably won't go back to it and so for me like it it was kind of this thought process it was like okay like if I can have this character succeed then I can put away that that little part of me that might still hold on to what that could have been, which is very apropos for the themes of the book, I would say. Too. Oh yeah. I, 
I find myself doing those sorts of things with my books too, like sort of exploring like, well, I never got to do this or I never got to become like a professional baker or whatever. And like, well, I'll just write a character who gets to do that. And then it's like I get to vicariously kind of live out that little the little dream world, that little like, oh, I could have been this. Well, I am just in a book. Okay. I have a question for you now. Oh. So how we were talking about like <laughs> what's funny and I said, it's always like those weird little quirks and stuff. Like when people were children, what they like to play, like, were you one of those children who kind of liked to live in the fantasy games? Like oh. you wanted to play? Yeah. Okay. That's okay. What I, just, you, you, I just, I you just know curious. the kid. Yeah. You know, the kids that were like off in their own little world, they showed up in like a costume to kindergarten and they were like, today I'm going to the moon. And everyone's like, oh, you're like space. <laughs> okay. TJ, we're going to the moon today. You know, yeah. I was that kid. Were you that kid too? Yeah, well, I was thinking about this recently because uh, you sent me the questions in advance. And what I was thinking about a little bit, <laughs> you mentioned something about my therapist. And I was like, <laughs> we'll get to that. Don't yeah, worry. <laughs> no, I know. But I was I was talking with my therapist and I was saying something along the lines of I was like, oh, you know, now that I think about it, like when I was a child, I was always very much drawn to like, I want to play house. I want to play teacher. I want to play make believe. Like I always wanted to exist in another world. And I always wanted everyone to join in on my fantasy. Yes. Like you can be a recurring character in my soap opera, but we're not going into your soap well, like, this is general hospital the, not days of our lives yeah. like their games were badly written exactly. none of the characters were fully fleshed out I was, galore yeah i was like i've already got one like ready made like we can just do mine and like yeah it was very frustrating to be the only good one at being a kid <laughs> <laughs> and now you know that novelists are born not made <laughs> We're the worst on the playground. Well, let's just skip to the therapy question. <laughs> <laughs> now that you've now that you've teased the audience, I was going to ask you. Um, along with this book, a lot of your books seem to deal with themes of family and home, and what those mean, and they just seem to come up again and again. So let's hash that out. Why? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I was thinking about this a little bit. And I would say that for me, like I I got to, when I was promoting this book, I got to write a little guest blog post about, it's, it's my tips for time travel. And it's about my three favorite fantasy films. And I, as I was like picking out the movies that I was going to do, because a lot of romance authors will do like playlists for their books, but I like to do watch lists. So you can like watch a like, you can either watch like movies that inspired it or movies or TV shows that are mentioned in the book. And I was like, I described myself in that article as like uh, a bunch of pieces of pop culture stacked on top of each other inside a fashionable trench coat. And I was like, I kept thinking about home and the idea of home and the one piece of like media that has stuck with me, like since I was very young and that I've watched probably more than anything is The Wizard of Oz. Oh yeah. And The Wizard of Oz is queer coded on so many levels. Um, not, not just least, least of all Judy Garland, but there, that, she, is. there she is, um, which she comes up in your book as well. Right. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. She does. <laughs> this I was like, pervasive. I read it closer than you did. This is how pervasive it is. Judy's everywhere. Yeah. Um, but I was just thinking about that idea of like, there's always something about coming home and finding home. And since this is the final book in the Boy Meets Boy series, and these are all new adult novels characters in their early 20s figuring out how to be um, young and messy and in love and what it means to be an adult is that there is this like tension on who was I before when I was growing up, when I had a sense of place where someone told me when I needed to eat, when I needed to sleep, when I needed to bathe versus who do I want to be when I am completely independent? It's like people that are living in that middle ground, you know, it's like, you got to do your taxes, but you don't know how, like, you know, it's things like that. And so I think the idea of home is like this sense of comfort. I also kind of, I think for me is that there is something about a romance that really kind of entrances me when the characters refer to each other as home that like you can take home with you wherever you go. I think finding love that feels like that is what makes a romance novel successful to me. Like if I don't feel like these two characters are home to each other, then the whole book unravels. I usually probably am going to put it down. And so I think it just like comes up again and again because I just, that's what I believe love should feel like. That's so poignant. And I think especially for queer romance, because so often in real life, you know, queer people, queer readers may not find you know, a fitting home for them in, you know, reality. And it's just nice to give them a little, a little bit of that, you know, a little bit of that in fiction. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that romance is such a powerful genre in the sense that it 
allows you the chance to explore both vulnerabilities and past traumas and hardships and mental illness, but it allows you to do it in the safe space of this like place where we come to open a book to suspend our disbelief, knowing that the comfort that by the end of the book, like these two characters are going to be better than where we found them. I find it hysterical and this is maybe a little controversial, Ooh. but I, you know, I, I love pub day. I love putting out books. I love knowing what people are taking away from the things that I've written. And one of the the things that has come up again and again about Nolan in this book is that when he starts, they're like, he was so unlikable. And I, what I think is so interesting about that is that he makes a lot of selfish decisions. And he does. I totally own up to that because he makes these selfish decisions in the heat of the moment because he thinks he needs to prove something. He needs to achieve something before he can earn love, before he deserves to be who he is. And I think what's so interesting about that is that it, it, I guess it kind of comes around to this idea that like humans are so fundamentally messy and the queer experience is so fundamentally messy that like we need to embrace the mess. We need to embrace the chaos and the evil. Like I want to support his rights just as I want to support his wrongs. Yes. You know, like we're wrong. Yeah. We're <laughs> wrongs. Give me the wrong comms. Like that should be a genre now. I absolutely agree because like it would be so boring to read about a character who does everything right and makes all the correct decisions and never makes any missteps ever. Like, okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't like that. Yeah. <laughs> I can't relate. <laughs> I I was going to say so I've been I've been reading your Chef's Choice and it's a great novel. If you haven't gotten it already, you should you should get it today and and read it and get it signed. And I've been reading it and what I love so much about the relationship between Luna and JP. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure. Um is I that think. Yeah, no. I you're like I put it out a while ago. It doesn't matter. <laughs> um what I love so much about them is that they come to these boiling points of butting heads on these specific topics and we as readers are obviously going to have a bias one way or another. We're going to take a side because that's just what we're wired to do as human beings. But I love that like you give them a chapter to cool off apart and then they have to come back together and confront this and you get to hear them airing out their dirty, like their dirty laundry. It's not dirty. It's like it's just how they were raised, what their view of the world is. And you get to kind of explore different perspectives that you may have never touched before. And I think that's so cool that you can do that in a romance because there's just space to sit with these characters and understand who they are as people and what they need to like let love into their lives. Yeah. And also like you and I, with those two books um, that you mentioned, Chef's Choice and, and New Adult, these are 20 something kids. They're children. <laughs> They're, you know, if they didn't make any mistakes or they weren't a mess, then like, that's also not realistic. Like, yeah. I don't even want to tell you what I was doing at 20. Like, I was making way worse decisions than Nolan was. <laughs> well, I want that book next. <laughs> Let's not the do memoir. That. The memoir. Um, so that was some deep stuff that we just went through. Do you feel like this was like your therapy session for the week? Yeah, yeah, I do. do you, should we move on to something that's Let's a little do less something light? Fluffy? Something, yeah. Let's talk about 13 going on 30. Amazing. Um one of my favorite rom-coms of all time like a wild wild movie the plot is just bananas yes yeah i watched it for the first time in six years last uh -huh. night. so i had that formative experience with it probably watched it 700 times and then i didn't watch it when i wanted to pitch this book because i was like it's just going to be too influenced by the movie if i even bother to touch it so i'm just going to write it the way i want to write it and then i'll revisit it and so last night we watched it in celebration of this book coming out and i was like does it hold up much better than big, <laughs> which that was funny to me because I, I, I said I had never seen it, but I, I took it back because I think I had watched it like on TV and passing. I'd seen big in chunks. Big is weird. It's that weird. Is a 12 year old child in the yep. body of like a 30 year old man yep. having a full on relationship with a grown adult woman. Yep. They're having intimate moments together. I was like, this is uncomfy. Um, 13 going on 30 never puts us through that. 13 going on 30 says like, they Maybe. probably, they just kiss, but yeah. that's, we'll move on from that. And the one thing that I actually struck me about watching it this time is that there is this kind of wonderful thread through the story of that, like, do you, have you ever heard the trope about the rom-com protagonist is usually so bumbling and bad at their job? 
she's always got like her hair up in a messy bun. She's always spilling the coffee. Yeah, yeah. like yeah, she's just she's <laughs> always having a bad day. Yeah, like, we love her. And but but the but someone loves her anyway, right? That doesn't happen in 13 going on 30. This 13 year old girl is better at her job than Judy Greer, who is a fully grown woman. I was like, wow, Judy Greer should never have had this job. Like she, she literally got her idea and everyone was like, no, the 13 year old girls is better. That's, but like, then I think about as an adult, the office jobs that I've had, like the real adult jobs that I've had. And now that I'm thinking about it, like, yeah, a 13 year old girl probably would have been much better than some of my coworkers at our jobs. Like, well, I think that's so funny too, because I think there's something to be said about like, I don't know if you can resonate with this, but like I've had jobs before where I have felt like friction in them, where I have felt like, <laughs> I don't know if my parents are watching this from home, but like, I remember I took, I had my first job uh, in high school was working at an ice cream parlor and I for the first couple months, I was like, I have my own money. I can do whatever I want. I can go to the mall and get whatever I want. Like, I was so excited to be working at this ice cream shop. And then like six months into the job, I was like, I'm just feeding capitalism. Like, <laughs> these are empty calories. And like, all these people are gonna get a disease because the ice cream is bad. Like, it was just like, I came home and my parents were like, what is wrong with you? Like, it is ice cream. It's not that deep. And I think, I think I <laughs> turned into Lennon at the no, PTPY. No. <laughs> I was basically like Carvel is Satan and I'm bringing a picket sign next time. Uh, no, uh, but I, I had this kind of moment and I think I, I kind of put some of that tension into Nolan in the book because we meet him at a turning point in his comedy career where like he's been burned by stand up quite a few times because there's like all those moments where you get on the brink of like what you think is going to be your break and it doesn't work out for you. And he's been waiting tables and doing the stand like doing the open mics and it just hasn't been panning out. And his parents don't quite understand like you have nothing to show for what do, you, what do you have to show for this you're hawking nachos basically you're hawking overpriced nachos and so his sister's like you should get a real job you should get a real job at dupe like you should work in whatever and, and he knows instinctually that he's like i'm gonna be constricted like there's something about me that's gonna die if i which sounds so dramatic but something about me is going to wither in this environment like i i'm not i'm not going to be fulfilled and he even says that he makes a really selfish choice right before the time jump and he says, like, I really, no one has to live with the ramifications of my choices, but me. They don't have to like them, but I hope one day they can respect them. And I think there's something to be said about young adults, like having that mindset where it's like, I need to do something that matters to me. Otherwise, the next like six years of my life are going to be absolutely miserable. Yeah. You know? I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to talk about Mark Ruffalo. Sorry to bring it back. Yeah, no. Um, Who wouldn't? He's the love interest. Would you call him a love interest in 13 going on 30? Yeah. I would say so. I think my partner described him to me this morning as like a regular guy who yeah. just happens to stumble into a rom-com. A regular dude. Well, he is. Because well, it's so funny because I uh, TikTok knows me better than I know me. And <laughs> TikTok fed me an old Mark Ruffalo interview around the time that he was promoting 13 Going on 30. And someone was like, what do you think of the film? Like, which is a wild question to ask an actor promoting a movie. <laughs> and he said, well, I'm not really the target audience for this. And she was like, oh, yeah, it's a chick flick. And he's like, well, it's not that. I just don't really watch romantic comedy. It's like, that's just not the kind of movie I watch. And I was like, after watching it last night, it's like, oh yeah, this is totally an actor playing a guy who's never seen a romantic comedy yes, before. Yes. And now he's stumbled into one and he has no clue what he's supposed to do with that information. Not only that, he was typecast as playing that guy in rom-coms for like all of the odds. I know. And it's very funny. And then I just want to point out Jennifer Garner. We were robbed of a bunch of Jennifer Garner rom-coms because she barely did any other ones. And she is hysterical. She's in that so movie. funny. She's so, so funny. I also really, this has nothing to do with the book. <laughs> we're, Sorry. Just about we're just chatting. <laughs> We're just chatting. <laughs> I I think that there was something about movies from the early 2000s when I was like eight, nine, 10, like whatever, that really stuck with me because they were movies that one celebrated like the joy of just like being alive. They were like, because we made it cool? through the millennial. Yeah. Thing, the, the Y2K, we did it. Yeah. And they were also so almost like slapstick. They were so, they would take a joke to its extreme and then walk it back into sentimentality and then bring it back to its extreme. I rewatched um, Uptown Girls 
I've never the seen the Brittany that. Murphy Dakota fan. If you haven't seen it, you have to watch it. It is basically now we're just talking about Uptown Girls. But anyway, in the book, Nolan is is a stand up comedian, and he has a little bit of an episode in his work um, where uh, a, a saloon style door smacks him in the face, and he gets a fractured nose. Something very similar happens in Uptown Girls, and they refer to it, and they say like, "Oh my God, such an underrated classic! Like it's not every day your friend has a Brittany Murphy in Uptown Girls," and you know, it's like swinging door and it's Brittany Murphy and this precocious little child. And Brittany Murphy is like a down on her luck heiress who now has to be a nanny. And it's this precocious like little girl who lives on like the Upper East Side and her parents are never around and they have to bond and figure out how to be, you know, a, a, you know, uptown girls. Uptown girls, exactly. <laughs> and I just think there's something so hysterical about this premise that is just like wacky, but yet rooted in real genuine human emotion. And so I hope when people read new adult specifically that they, they come for the wacky time jump, but they stay for the more grounded um, uh, feelings, like the gushy moments, the mushy gushy moments, the emotions, the emotions. Yeah. And I just want to point out super quick. I found that drew the love interest, a new adult, is Mark Ruffalo-esque in that he's just like a normal, nice guy. Just a nice guy. He's not like a supermodel. He's not like, you know, he's not stuck up. No. I mean, I did base him physically on Prince Harry. So he's a little bit of a supermodel. So, okay. So he is perfect. (laughs) Yeah. He's six foot three. He's got blue eyes, red hair, freckles. You can pick him out in a New York city street. Yeah. Yeah. I'm seeing it now. But I mean, average guy in the sense that he is like, he's not demand, like, like, I think Nolan describes him basically like he is definitely more reserved. He has to get other people to come up to him, but like his presence demands your attention in a room because he's so warm, like he's so wholesome. But the one thing that he doesn't have um, in common with Mark Ruffalo's character is that he knows the romance tropes. Yes. Like the back of his hand. Because he's a big romance, romance reader, reader yeah, which yes. we love. We I love. love a romance reader, love interest slash love interest. Mm. So now that we've talked about all the movies we love, <laughs> yeah, really. Are there any other classic rom-com movies that you would like to see given a queer retelling? Oh my gosh. That is a great question. I don't think this one would work, but one of my favorite romances is Moonstruck with yeah. Cher and Nicolas Cage. And I really love that kind of like the moon made me do it. Like, I think that's very funny. Um, and so I think that could be really fun to play with. I also think it would be very fun to make like a queer Johnny Camerary, the Nicolas Cage character. Oh my who, God, like he's yes. missing a hand and he's so angry and he like bakes bread. Like, it's just so good. I'm sold. Yeah, I'm sold too. <laughs> um, but one of them that I am actually, I'm, I'm currently in edits for is that I'm writing another Christmas novel and it is a queer spin on the Santa Claus, which is not a rom-com. No, but. Uh, but not at all. But it is like I'm taking the tenets of a property that is very much embedded in a in a person who is questionable. Forget. Yeah. And I'm taking all that good stuff and I'm saying gay little hands. It's like I'm putting a gay little hands. to the heterosexuality. Inject. The gay. The gay, exactly. <laughs> and it, it's it's called the Marius Misters. And they're they become like through 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 some assault, essentially, uh, a frying pan of Santa Claus. They become Santa Claus and the first ever Marius Mister at the North Pole. And so it's like this whole story that's kind of like taking what is probably a very heteronormative idea of a fictional jolly man who flies around one night a year to deliver gifts. And it says, like, let's make that queer. Let's see what this looks like if we um, if if we open it up to broader experiences, and so I'm just having fun doing that. This sounds like such an excellent romp. Is that the next book of yours that we will see out, or is there something else? No. So, uh, so I have w- another book coming out in January that's called The Fake Dating Game. Um, and this is another one of my deep obsessions coming up to the surface, which is I love supermarket sweep. I love Who it. Who doesn't? I love it so much. I actually learned on the day that we did the cover reveal for the fake dating game that there's a channel on Roku TV that just plays 24-7 supermarket sweep. Like old school supermarket sweep. No, with I the know. Commercials. I with know the it. Commercials. With the commercials. I was <laughs> like, oh my God, I could buy a Hoover. Um, it would be great. Sponsored by Jelly Belly. 
And I was just obsessed with it. So it's a fake dating romance um, between a dance instructor and a hotel concierge who agreed to fake date on a supermarket sweep style reality show to win the money so they can both get themselves out of debt. Um, and it's fun. It's weird. It's it's probably the weirdest thing I've ever written. And But it's also one of the most fun writing experiences I've ever had. You had me at supermarket sweep fake dating Hoover. <laughs> <laughs> There's no Hoover in the book, but okay, there okay. is a very uh i would say explicit cucumber use of a cucumber in the book uh (laughs) we should have let that i guess um i think it's time for questions who has uh, a a question for us is for the q a portion anybody oh i'm just gonna go through yes is there something in your life that you wish you could have like a seven-year do with pop back and redo it? Oh, I'm just going to repeat that for the folks online. The question was, Timothy, is there anything that happened to you in your life that you would like to have a seven-year do-over for? So I I had a feeling I was going to get questions about time travel. <laughs> um, <laughs> are you the waiter from the... <laughs> No, I, I, I think I didn't consciously think about it until like maybe a week ago that people would ask me questions like, oh, would you want to redo something? Would you want to go in the future? Where would you want to go? And after writing this book, there's something about watching 13 going on 30 or big where you're like, oh my gosh, it's so cool. They're an adult and everything's great. I write mostly from the first person present tense and that is an existential nightmare. He woke up with a seven year gap in his memory. He is in a body he does not know. He is like, he calls it high stakes rent the runway in the book. (laughs) He's like, this is not mine. It's on loan for now. Like that just sounds like a Kafka ass nightmare to me. And so I just don't want to mess with time. I don't want to create a portal. I don't want to ripple anything. I don't want to change anything. I, I'm very blessed to be here now writing books that I get to share with wonderful people. And so I like the trajectory I'm on and would like to not mess that up. So we do not want to wake up tomorrow, anyone who's in charge and like, please don't send us to another time. Right. Unless okay. this is the seven year jump. Unless like, oh, this already happened. It. Right. And this is the outcome of that. <laughs> then I'll stay. Fun. I'll stay in this one. Oh yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I definitely wouldn't mind jumping. Yeah. Okay. We'll talk about that later. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think there was another question. Yes, hi, in the second row. What is your favorite snack and beverage to have while writing? Okay, so my favorite snack as of late is cereal. I love cereal. What kind? Um, I'm a big fan of the Honey O's from Trader Joe's, oh. but I am actually, well, I'm kind of off this kick now, but I was really on this kick of the, what they call the tiny fruity cuties. Um, is that real? Yeah, it is. <laughs> you just make it's that up. Basic, nope. It is Trader Joe's version of what I assume is Trix cereal. And I've been eating it like it's nobody's business. And it was super funny because I, I must have seen it behind like another box of cereal one day and I like bought it and it like wasn't actually supposed to be like on the floor. So the next time I came, they were giving out. <laughs> it was fine. <laughs> oh, no, I mean like, uh, not like on the floor. I mean like on the shelf. Okay. 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 Just pick it up the floor. The next time we go to Trader Joe's next week, they're giving out samples of it. Like, and there were boxes of it everywhere. And so I picked one up and I brought it to the register and the guy was like, oh, they got you, huh? They got you to buy it. I said, no, sir. I ate a whole box of this last week alone. I said, I had it before everyone else. Now everyone knows that it's not my secret anymore. So I'm back to the honey O's. Um, like, I got the preview on this cereal. Exactly. Um, no, but I love cereal. And then drinks, uh, I'm a little basic. I just like an iced coffee. I think iced coffee is is enough to power me through a good drafting session. That's wonderful. Thanks. Any other questions? I think I, oh, yes, hi. Viewers here. So the first question from Stacy is, hi, Timothy. How do you love to celebrate your books on Pub Day? So that was from Stacy online and wants to know how Timothy celebrates pub day. Ooh, okay. So for the, I mean, this is book number three now. So every time I have taken the day off of work because my brain needs to not be thinking about anything that is not the eminent uh, unveiling of something I spent a lot of time and energy on. Um, I usually get myself a nice little coffee. I go on a nice little walk. I'll do... um, 
I usually go to bookstores. So like I, I went to lovely, we have a lovely um, all queer bookstore here on the hill called Little District Book. So I stopped in there and I said hello and I signed copies for them. And then I came here and like the lovely folks here had me sign copies for everyone at home and everyone who pre-ordered. Um, and then I basically just read a book and drank some more coffee. And then I, and now I'm here with you lovely people. And it was just very chill. I think leading up to like a launch event is always so nerve wracking because you know people have the book but you've never actually seen someone take it home with them before mm -hmm. and there's something really scary about that moment where it's like oh no please don't take my dog like <laughs> like well, I need that like that's my emotional support dog you know what I mean yeah um and with this book in particular I feel like it's it's a little bit of like the book of my heart in a way and so like letting go of it so today was the day where I said like I'm letting it go that's so lovely that you just had like a nice chill day because you're right it is like it can be a very stressful experience especially in the lead up yeah. so yeah hmm, treat yourself yes a question here is there like a dc like tv movie thing that you'd consider like doing a book based on that might be too niche off the cuff. Is there a DC movie or TV property that you would like to explore in a book? Huh. I don't know. I mean, I've only lived in DC since November, and so I'm still getting to know the city pretty well. But I think, like, if I were to write a romance set in Washington, DC, I would want to write the romance about the independent bookstore. I would want to write the romance about, like, the board game club. Like, I want to write the DC based romance about, like, the community garden, because I think a lot of DC based stuff is like, you're either a lawyer or a politician. And those I are the only two. <laughs> Sorry, you're a lawyer. Um, apologies I just feel like there is like it is such a rich city and what I've loved so much about it and like the is like the kind of weird stuff that goes on here like film like these like indie film festivals and like just, just like stuff like that I, I would want to explore maybe the more homey parts of DC DC can be a, a weird little town yeah, because it feels like there are a lot of people who are like transient, they're just here for a job, but then there are people who like really plant roots, there are people who are like really into their careers, people who are living on trust, fund. like, it is just kind of like the gamut, but it's not like New York City where like you feel, I don't know if you feel this way living there, but like there's a there's a level of like, I think Luna actually says this in your book, something like that, where there's comfort in the millions, right? Like, because you're you're not like, because you, it's, it's, it's almost so overwhelming that it's comforting. Whereas like here, like, if I'm going on a walk, I'm passing pretty much the same neighbors every day. You know what I mean? It's not like I'm, it's not like an overpopulated, like we don't have huge skyscrapers everywhere. And so like it has a homey feeling yeah. with still having the city vibe. So it's like the Hannah Montana best of both worlds feeling. It is the Hannah Montana. The city. Hannah Montana of cities. That should kind of be, I think, the new tourism board. I think we should call up the president and tell him that. TM, yeah. TM, TM, Mr. Biden. You're welcome. That one's free from us. Uh, do we have any other questions? Oh, yes, from online. Online. Uh, okay. Also, as a local DC author, have you ever hosted or would you be interested in hosting a writing workshop for romance authors, tips, conversation for aspiring romance writers? Okay. I'm going to try and remember all of that question from Stacy. Would you ever be interested in hosting a DC area writing workshop for aspiring romance authors? Absolutely. I think uh, what I love so much is that there is like a bustling romance community in this city, like in the DMV oh, area yeah. in general, like there is just romance authors and readers who are ravenous and love to share stories. I had the honor of, we were just talking about this back there, that I had the honor of being part of like the DC Public Library Day of Story, which was all about love. And I taught a workshop called The Anatomy of the Meat Cute, which was just basically like, I wasn't like, I, we have we have 60 minutes together. I can't tell you every part of a romance novel, but let's talk about like how you build two characters, put them in a room together and see what happens. Um, and I found, I really felt like that was very, very fun. And I mean, I have a little bit of imposter syndrome even at book number three, like I, it, it feels like every time I sit down to a blank word document, it's like, do I know words? Um, <laughs> Same. Can I string them together? Will they be cohesive or coherent? Um, but yeah, I think I would really enjoy that. I think there's just a, a, I think story is such a powerful connector. And so I think like talking about writing and craft is a really good way to get to know people. Absolutely. And, and to your point, like I also feel sometimes like, well, I don't know. I'm not an expert. I've just written a couple of books. I'm not, I'm not like, you know, a Pulitzer winner or anything, but then like 
as soon as you like sit down with somebody else who's like excited to talk about the genre, you st you start realizing like how much you have to say and like how much you actually know. I, not just me, like you too. <laughs> no, no, I know exactly what you mean. For a long time, and my bio always says this, like I always call myself a storyteller. I never call myself a writer or an author. And I think that comes from a sense of like imposter syndrome where it's like, okay, like I've written a couple of books, but does that know, does that mean like I could write the next great American novel? Like, I, I think there's that, like finding that validation within to be like, I'm a writer. I have the know how to help others come aboard because I think about it. There were so many people that helped me learn how to craft a book, create a co coherent character arc. Like those are things that we're not just like born knowing. Right. Right. So like, I, when you think about it and even if it was just in casual conversation like that impacted me and led me here so like if I can give that to someone else like I am thrilled to do that oh that would be lovely I would sign up <laughs> anybody, I think you're doing just fine on your own any do we have time for one more question one more question anybody yes hi is there any trope that you haven't written yet that you are itching to okay so this is cheating but as I said earlier, I'm working on a book called The Merriest Misters, and it's set in the North Pole, and it is actually a marriage in trouble romance. Oh. So these characters have been together for like six and a half years. They are married. They've bought their first house together, and like they have just realized the crushing weight of what that's going to look like for them. And <laughs> now, now let's just send them to the North Pole um, and see what happens there. Um, and Therapy. Yeah. And what I like about that is that like I think that so many romance novels are, and, and I love romance novels, this is not um, dunking on any romance novels, it's that they focus a lot on the falling part and not a lot on the sustaining part. Yeah. And I think like being in love is falling in love many times over again. And so I wanted to write a story where these people fell in love so hard, so fast, and are now like, what do we do now? Like it's plateaued a little bit. How do we figure this out? And now they're basically like doing snowball competitions and like judging gingerbread contests. And they're like, oh God, are we going to make it or not? Like, you know, so I I'm, I'm having a lot of fun exploring that because that's completely new territory for me. And it's like another facet of a love story that you don't get to see often because there is like, you know, and for good reason, a, a lot of focus on the initial like first kiss, first whatever. Um, that's fascinating. I want to read that so bad. Well, I hope it will be out in fall of 2024. Everyone, so, mark your calendars. Yeah. So thank you so much all for coming out and celebrating Timothy's great new book, New Adult. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did, which is a lot. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Hey, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, we are going to flip the space a little bit and bring out our table so that our lovely authors can sit and sign. Um, if you'd like to purchase copies, they're available upstairs. We do, you know, these events are possible because of the support of our customers who shop from us and who attend. And we appreciate you being here. And we have copies upstairs. Uh, if you are willing and able to set your chairs to the side so the staff member can collect them. Um, and we'll start the signing line kind of in the front of this mind, body, spirit section. Thanks. Bookstore Romance Day this Saturday, 10% off all Romance titles. Woo!